So it gives me very great pleasure today to welcome our first keynote speaker, Professor Deborah Hall from our own School of Social Sciences on Malaysia campus. Now, Deborah today is going to talk about positive education and we're really excited to hear about this really innovative practice. And um, for those of you who don't know Deborah, um, she's fairly recently joined us, but has an illustrious career um, spanning a range of um, subjects and a range of institutions, including working at um, the University of Nottingham, where she led a prestigious translational research centre, um, and then um, working here leading our team on positive psychology, which is where her talk today comes from. Um, so we're really pleased to welcome you today, Deborah. And without any further ado, I will hand over to you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Rosemary. Um, and it's great to be invited to uh, talk to you all today and to share some of our experiences on the Malaysia campus. So I joined Harriet Watt University in Malaysia in February. So I've been here um, around eight months now. And um, in part of my leadership role, I'm working with um, academic staff to really embed positive education in our university teaching and to continue the great work that has already been started here at Harriet Watt. So I'm pleased to share some of those um, experiences with you in this presentation. Um, I'm pleased to take questions at the end but as Rosemary said, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to pop them in the chat um, and we can pick them up, um, pick them up at the end. So I'm going to be um, talking about um, positive psychology uh, generally, and then to share some examples of good practice. Um, at the Malaysia campus and also share with you some of the research that we've started to do to evaluate the impact of some of our teaching approaches. So really keen to um, share those with you and um, hear any feedback that you have to share with us. So just to kind of kick off with a, a general introduction, <laughs> I just wanted to start off with Scrabble. Now, in the movement restrictions here in Malaysia over the last year or so, I've been playing a lot of Scrabble, and I'm always on the lookout for ways to um, expand my vocabulary. Um, now, in May of this year, there was an article in The New Yorker that was focused on a concept that's entered our modern day vocabulary, um, and that's involution. It's a word that describes feelings of weariness, burnout, and despair. And the article in the New Yorker was called China's Involuted Generation. This word was actually one of China's most commonly used words in 2020. And the word in Chinese is actually made up of two separate words. Um, Lower screen has a grey box. Maybe you have camera, video gallery. Um, not quite sure that what that means. I do have my chat box open, so maybe I will minimise that, and hopefully the grey box that you can see disappears. That's um, better. Thanks, Deborah. Okay, <laughs> great. So, um, just coming back to the word uh, involution. In, it's made of two Chinese characters um, that mean inside and rolling. And it describes um, a process of curling inwards, trapping individuals in what's called the experience of being locked in a competition that you feel is somewhat meaningless. Now, let's just, yeah, okay. So, Many young people in China can only see one way to be recognized and valued by society. And often that's about working really hard at college, getting a well-paid job and buying an apartment, kind of getting on that rat race. 
And so it's an ideal that drives many students to work really, really hard and work in humane hours. And the epitome of this kind of lifestyle that captures the word involution was um, sort of captured really well in social media last September when a student at one of Beijing's elite universities was caught on video riding his bicycle at night. And if you kind of look at that uh, picture, you can just capture he's got a laptop balanced um, on his handlebars um, as he's cycling along. And there was a flurry of social media debate about this really hardworking uh, lifestyle. And from that, another phrase was born, the 007 lifestyle. And here we're not talking about the James Bond lifestyle, but this phrase means working online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, it's no wonder that some of our youth are becoming disillusioned with this monotony of working life. They're asking, what is all this hard work for? Now, this brings us to thinking about the opposite of involution, which is well being. And whereas involution or an involuted state of mind focuses only on accomplishments in life, like financial success or getting promoted onto the next rung of the ladder. We know that focusing only on accomplishments is not really enough to sustain a sense of well-being. There's so much more to having a good life. Now, positive psychologists have identified four other essential ingredients to a happy and fulfilling life. Um, and so my question is, does anybody like to hazard a guess what one of these other ingredients might be? Um, I can't monitor the chat because I've had to close my um, chat box. So maybe you could just open up your microphone and shout it out. Anybody have a guess? What are the sort of key ingredients to having a sense of well-being? Anybody like to have a guess? Not sure. So from the chat, we've got being okay. clear about expectations, so, self-confidence. Oh, we're getting them now, Deborah. Physiological yeah. aspects. Certainly physical health. Being physically healthy helps kind of promote mental, good mental health. That, that's true. So great. Thank you. Some of those ideas are captured in some of these concepts that I'm um, going to go through. And thanks, Rosemary, for just monitoring the, um, the chat. So the first one that positive psychologists talk about is fostering positive emotions. And you can see some examples here like joy, gratitude, love, um, interest sense of pride, et cetera. These positive emotions can undo any harmful effects of negative emotions. And if we try and consciously focus on positive emotions in daily life, then it helps to foster good habits of thinking and behaving in a positive way. So that's one of the ingredients that positive psychologists talk about in terms of promoting well-being. Another one is called engagement. And what this describes is the experience of living fully. So I'm sure you've all had an experience when you're really living in the present moment and you're focusing so much on the task that you're doing that time just seems to fly by. This tends to happen when you're engaged in something that you really love and builds on um, some of your own personal strengths. So if you're artistic, it could be painting. If you're sporty, it could be playing football or watching football. Um, those are some examples of what positive psychologists call um, engagement. And when we're doing that, we're, we're feeling good about ourselves and that promotes well-being. Uh, the third additional ingredient is uh, positive relationships. Now, as humans, we're very social creatures and we um, need to feel supported and loved and valued by others. 
So these social networks help to promote a sense of well-being. We can celebrate with our um, friends and loved ones when things go well, but those people around us also help us when things are not going so well and help us overcome that. And the final ingredient is called uh, meaning. And when we're engaged in doing something meaningful, then it helps give a sense of value and self-worth. At Heriot Watt Malaysia, and I'll come on to this, we talk very much about developing a sense of purpose in life because it helps give our students and our staff something to focus on what's really important. And then when significant challenges come along or adversities, it can help sort of keep that focus and a guiding light to overcome any difficult uh, situations. So the science of positive psychology has shown that when we have all of these um, five um, key ingredients, then it helps us feel great and we live well, we do well, and we flourish. Um, now, the, these five key elements form the basis of a theoretical framework for well-being. It's called PERMA. And it's an acronym for those five key elements that I've just talked about. And this is a concept that's developed by um, a psychologist called Martin Seligman. His picture's down at the bottom left. And he actually founded this branch of psychology in the year 2000, just over 20 years ago. He founded positive psychology as a sort of antidote to more conventional psychology. Because a lot of conventional psychology sort of focuses on fixing the negative, like trying to fix involution, for example, whereas positive psychology focuses on enhancing the positives first. And it does this by um, developing strategies for helping people achieve happiness and fulfillment in life. So that's a little bit about the scientific background to some of our thinking around how can we apply some of these principles of positive psychology in what we do in our everyday teaching practice. Now at Harriet Watt University we're applying positive psychology principles and practices to um, our education. Our students undertake experiential learning activities and that helps them develop knowledge, skills, behaviours and attitudes that lead not just to academic excellence, which is um, obviously important, but we also focus on personal effectiveness, resilience and well-being. And we put that idea of cultivating um, purpose at the centre because we see this as essential for creating that intrinsic motivation and drive that will ultimately lead to success, flourishing um, and impact. So I'd like to just play you a short video that um, just describes our approach. Everyone wants to flourish, have success and impact on the world. But how do you get from here to there? Excellence is essential, but it's not enough on its own. You also need personal effectiveness. Those are the transferable skills that employers are looking for. Excellent communication, leadership, and emotional intelligence. And your journey through life will probably have its ups and downs. You need resilience, learning how to deal with the bad times, learning how to pace yourself and when to seek help. Knowing who you are and cultivating an optimistic outlook are great personal resources for well-being, for life. A Harriet Watt University education empowers our students beyond academic achievements by offering this distinctive learning experience that instills a strong sense of purpose and gives them all the tools to get from here to there. So there are lots of different ways to help 
um, students flourish and to promote a flourishing community. We can um, kind of nurture success and impact at university through supporting development in each of these four key domains that I mentioned, knowledge, skills, behaviours and attitudes. And so I wondered if anybody was willing to share any of their own personal thoughts or experiences of any good practice that um, they use to try and help students flourish in terms of their knowledge, skills, behaviors, or attitudes. If you could type in the chat, maybe Rosemary, if you want to just pick one or two comments that people put in. So any sharing on your own teaching practice in any one of those four key domains. So first comment coming in is encouraging them by considering their efforts and mm -hmm. then making their learning relevant to their context. Mm -hmm. So the first one can help foster motivation and help build a positive attitude to trying, even if the student doesn't always succeed or get good grades, it's that effort that is really important. And we've two points linked to that. So mm -hmm. encouragement not to give up, especially in relation to dissertations and <laughs> praise and reinforce good practice. And yeah. a separate point about asking questions and listening attentively. Brilliant, yeah. So um, the penultimate example was about fostering positive emotions through giving praise. Um, a few other examples that um, I'd um, jotted down um, was um, modeling good linguistic styles, using active listening, for example, being interested in what students say. I think one of the comments that one of the audience wrote down was similar to that. And in terms of attitudes, trying to foster in our students a, what we call a growth mindset. So uh, not giving up in the face of adversity, but looking um, at uh, interpreting a difficult situation as an opportunity to, to grow and to learn new things. Um, so those are just some ideas. Um, and it sounds like, you know, you're bringing some of those skills um, as a practitioner into some of the work that, that you're already uh, doing with students. Now, Martin Seligman and others talk um, about positive education in quite a specific way. And um, this is quite an interesting report that they've published on positive education as part of the Global Happiness Policy Report that's published every year. And this um, brings together practitioners from psychology, economics, um, civil society, business and government, et cetera. And they survey best practice and policies and um, kind of share that um, with interesting readers. So there's always a chapter in each of the um, annual publications around education. And in that 2018 um, report, these are some of the um, characteristics that define what a positive psychologists see as positive education. Um, and you, you can see a flavor of some of these examples are about promoting educators as reflective practitioners. We've got rigorous evaluation, not just of what the students have learned by their academic grades, but also of their um, sense of well-being, of promoting empowerment and creativity, but maybe also being sensitive to cultural differences, which is very relevant to us at Harriet Watt, given that we are a global university that is operating on in three different countries. Um, so in the rest of my talk, 
what I want to do is kind of try and bring things back to Harriet Watt University in Malaysia and share some examples of um, some of the experiential learning activities that we've been offering to our students within this positive education framework and also sharing one or two of our evaluations where we're trying to do just that, not just evaluate student learning outcomes, but also um, their sense of well-being. So here are just some of those examples. And it goes without saying that we offer a lot of those typical learning opportunities and supportive networks, like peer-assisted learning where students can help other students, student success advisors that help build supportive relationships to students, counseling, et cetera. But there are some additional features which we feel are quite distinctive to a Harriet Watt education as well. And so they're kind of uh, listed in the mix here. So I'm just going to try and briefly highlight a couple of them. Um, one is about our Happier You um, campaign. Um, now, this campaign helps to foster positive emotions which if you remember is one of those major elements in the PERMA model of well-being. How do we do that? Well, we have a um, Happier You team and they organize a series of regular events, activities and communications to remind our staff and students about the importance of those positive emotions. So you can see some of them here. Uh, we've got a gratitude wall in the main entrance to the campus when you come um, in. Students can post uh, messages and um, thanks to express feelings of hope and optimism. And we refreshed our gratitude wolf when the students came back last week. And we asked our students to tell us what they were most grateful for in the past year during the pandemic. And so you can see there's loads and loads of really positive and inspiring messages um, that students have shared. Um, adjacent to our campus building, we have the Happy Cafe. Uh, and here again, students can post pictures and share good news messages. We also partner with an organization in the UK called Action for Happiness. It's a global movement of people that are committed to building a happier, more caring society. And across campus, we help to communicate those 10 keys to a happier living through posters that are dotted around campus. Um, every year, we also celebrate International Day of Happiness, um, which is supported by the United Nations and also um, Action for Happiness. So um, another opportunity for sharing uh, interested to hear from anybody else on the call about what do you do to cultivate positive emotions? We had one or two examples already about how you cultivate positive emotions, maybe in the classroom. Um, any sharing about how one might cultivate positive emotions more generally? I've just kind of put up four different kinds of positive emotions to help you think about any specific examples to share. So from the chat, we've got count your blessings. Mm -hmm. That sounds a little bit similar to gratitude in that encouraging students to count their blessings is thinking about what they've got to um, be thankful for. Anything else? A comment that says moment to arrive. I'm not quite sure moment what that is. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, kindness. Kindness. Yeah, yeah. So certainly as academic staff, we can model kindness and we can um, give positive reinforcement to students who um, are kind. Um, quite a few of our students on the Malaysia campus do community service projects and a lot of those are focused around helping others who are less fortunate than themselves. And a last comment here, smile. <laughs> yeah, smile. It's an easy thing to do. 
um, and it helps us kind of touch all students. Um, yeah, that, that's a really great example. Um, another one for me, just to mention, uh, kind of related to that because it's a really easy thing to do, but with respect to interest or showing interest, you know, all of us are uh, probably personal tutors to students. So we are the student's main point of contact for any um, issues to discuss or any concerns and showing genuine interest in students' well-being is one way that um, we can cultivate positive emotions through our role as personal tutors. But thanks for sharing those um, great examples of best practice. So I mentioned on the Malaysia campus, we celebrate International Day of Happiness. And this is something that um, staff and students from all campuses can join in. Um, in March um, this year on the International Day of Happiness, we had a live webinar that we beamed from campus. You can see some pictures of our uh, recording studio. Uh, we had a range of uh, speakers talking about different aspects of happiness and our psychology society students did um, a bit of a survey asking people about their mental health and we had some active Q&A um, to address a wide range of issues that uh, members of the public and other attendees um, asked and that was a really good way of focusing on reminding people to um, experience positive emotions um, and it attracted quite a lot of local press coverage. So that was great. I think one of you mentioned um, about being kind to yourself or, uh, and being kind to yourself as well as your students is uh, something to also kind of bear in mind because a tired, grumpy teacher um, is not an effective teacher. And it's important to look after yourself as well as uh, looking after your students. Um, <clears throat> we have an effective learning manager here on uh, campus and she supports our academic staff to embed good practices in their teaching. And um, Stella, our effective uh, learning manager, talks about the Pomodoro technique. Um, don't know whether anybody's familiar with this. It's called Pomodoro because um, the Italian word for tomato is Pomodoro. And I don't know whether you've got one of these in your kitchen. My mum used to have one of these. It's a, a tomato timer that kind of times cooking in the kitchen. But this technique is so called because the idea is after 25 minutes of focused activity, it's always good just to take a break um, before you continue and have another period of focused activity. So the idea here is that you turn off all distractions. In the classroom, the idea is that you just take a pause from your teaching and give students uh, a bit of a break. And this is not just for the students, but it also helps you take a break because science shows that we're most effective in our thinking in short bursts, and then we need to give ourselves a little bit of downtime before we go back to, uh, to thinking again. So I don't know whether you kind of implement this in your teaching practice, but one thing that we try and do here on the Malaysia campus is to really take a, a proper pause in the middle of an hour long lecture um, and this is just kind of one, one example that um, our effective learning manager highlights. Hi, everybody. Highlights. I'm Teresa from AHF. I'm not going to And I'm here to walk you through, through the whole looking. thing. But if you look on uh, YouTube, there's lots of videos that you can download that are just short, sort of five minute. This is a two minute kind of stretch. So I encourage you, so you to stand up, stretch your legs, stretch your arms breathe, and then you can come back um, to the second part of learning, feeling refreshed. So that's a, a, another technique that we do um, encourage when possible. 
So those are some different examples of things that we can do as teachers to promote positive emotions. Um, the second example that um, I'm going to talk about um, is part of our Empower program that we offer to all first year students um, at Harriet Watt Malaysia campus. And this course introduced, introduces students to many of the aspects of the PERMA model of well-being with some action learning so that the students can apply some of that learning um, in group-based activities. The formal title of this course is Self-Empowerment and Social Responsibility. And here you can see um, the different learning outcomes and also the course design is built around action learning. So students develop a personal impact statement that identifies their purpose and their strengths and then they get a chance to try and put some of those things into practice through a community project. Um, I'm just gonna share a quick video that if you haven't seen already, just describes this course. How excited and how happy I am to be here. Honestly, you are the best that humanity has to offer. You are the latest model. You are the youth of the nation. You are the people who are going to make this world a better place. The Empower program is a program that goes in four stages. It starts by knowing and leading self. It moves towards leading teams, leading communities, and eventually leading enterprise introduces the students to activities through them. They can define their impact, write their own impact statement, and be clear of their own purpose and what brings meaning to their life. The Empower program, which is offered to all Harriet Watt University Malaysia Year 1 students, applies positive education philosophies and practices which focus on building mental resilience, growth mindset, grit, and sense of well-being. Our students who will go through the Empower program would develop a key part of their life, of their future, which will help them stand out against the common graduates there is outside there. What I feel about today is like, because there are a lot of plans for us and we need to think about our purpose, so we are forced to think about like what we want to do in our life and I feel it's really meaningful. So today's session for me was very informative because now I know what I love doing and what the world needs and how it can shape me in the future. For this empowerment program, Harawa has taken this subject, this requirement and repackaged it in a way that it is consistent. It reaches out to you, to your past, your present and your future. It was really helpful. I think when I leave, I will definitely know what I want to do, not just in terms of my job or my financial security, but also what gives me a greater feeling of satisfaction. Throughout this program, it helped me to structure my goals so that I can plan one by one in order to achieve it. The Empower session, I actually feel very empowered and he has this thing where he tends to make us feel like we can do anything and there's nothing that we cannot do. Today was a reminder for me and remind us that emotional intelligence is one of the priorities in our life other than IQ. This is my first session and Professor Mostak made it very enlightening to know how to control emotional intelligence and eventually in work life and how to be a productive member of society. Research has shown that emotional intelligence and also mental resilience are the skills that we will need to succeed in this century, especially with disruptive technology and automation. And we are on the front foot. We are preparing our students for that future. Be empowered. Ladies and gentlemen, we have launched the Empower program, which is taken by every student at Harriet Watt University, Malaysia, to develop their full potential in a holistic and experiential manner. I believe that providing a supportive environment 
for our youth to flourish represents a comprehensive and holistic philosophy to prepare the youth of today for the challenges of tomorrow. Great, so hopefully that gives you an idea of um, the program. The Empower program is something that um, is available to students throughout the three years, but this course that they're doing the first year is, is part of that level one that Prof Mushtaq talked about, knowing and leading self. Now, I mentioned that um, the, um, the Global Happiness Forum has a report every year and they promote the idea of being a reflective practitioner looking at the impact of teaching practices that embed positive psychology not just for learning but for positive outcomes and so in the few minutes that I've got left I'm just going to share with you a piece of research that um, my colleagues did um, a couple of years ago evaluating the benefits the perceived benefits of this course um, on self-empowerment and knowing and leading self. Um, so here's our conceptual model. We, were, um, look, we had five different concepts that we were um, interested in evaluate, evaluating. Our primary hypothesis was um, to look at how the course design and the way that it was taught had an influence on some of those positive education learning outcomes. And we were also then interested in any downstream impacts on happiness and life satisfaction. So we measured that in a range of different ways. We had some survey questions about the course design. We had some survey questions about the educator style. Some other questions where students could talk about their perception of the learning outcomes that they'd gained. And we measured um, happiness and life satisfaction with some standardized measures. So we use structural equation modeling. It's a statistical method to look at the relationships between multiple variables. So this is what our measurement model looked like. And then inputting the survey responses from all of our students enabled us to quantify those relationships. Um, we had 350 students um, participate um, and they completed the survey before and after the, the course. And we did some follow up with interviews as well. So as I say, here's the, the measurement model and we looked at how the data supported that measurement model. And um, these are the results that we found. So there was a strong effect of course design and educator style on the learning outcomes. Um, and you can see that most of that effect came from the design of the course. Um, the, um, the number on that arrow from course design to learning outcomes is, is the biggest, um, 0.61. There was a kind of less of an impact on um, subjective happiness and life satisfaction. It was statistically significant, but it was quite small. So the biggest effect was actually um, improving students' perception of achieving some of those positive education learning outcomes. Um, as I said, we, we measured happiness and satisfaction before and after, and there were um, kind of rather negligible differences in those quantitative methods. But the interview data that we collected was quite interesting because it uncovered some unexpected and positive ways in which the course had been beneficial to the students. And I'm just gonna share with you a couple of quotes from our students. So the first one um, is around the theme of um, a, students really appreciating that the education that they're receiving is distinctive. Um, it's offering things that they've never really thought about before, and it helps them reflect on who they are and what kind of person they are. Um, 
it helps develop personal effectiveness. So this student recognized that um, the action learning enabled them to uh, develop their team working skills. And that gave them a sense of satisfaction when they completed that. It encouraged a growth mindset. Um, so this student said that the, uh, their experience helped them find their potential and identify things that they could do better or improve on. So this student kind of wants to use this as an opportunity to continue to grow. Um, here's a, another example. Um, this student realizes that one shouldn't just focus on money and those material benefits, but there are other things um, in life that are, are important to give one a sense of purpose and well-being. So those findings from our initial study show that um, this structured positive education program can help to improve students' um, personal effectiveness. And it has sowed the seeds for a growth mindset, even though in terms of the measurements, it might not have actually changed at the moment their sense of well-being and overall happiness. Um, so just to kind of um, wrap up then, um, I hope I've shared with you some examples of how we can counteract those um, uh, kind of negative aspects of um, maybe poor mental health, the sense of involution, particularly that have been catalyzed by the lockdown during the pandemic, when students have been a little bit isolated from their friends and have had to continue their studies um, online. We can help counteract um, any negative feelings by promoting a sense of well-being through our teaching and helping students to build relationships with one another, as well as with the academic staff um, at Harriet Watt. So through our programs, we try and promote well-being, success, flourishing, and also grit. Um, and uh, I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was absolutely fascinating and I'm sure has given many people here um, lots of food for thought. So before we jump in to the questions, if I can just ask you to show your appreciation for Deborah with a, a quick round of applause, please. Um, so thank you very much, Deborah. Okay, so we have some questions in the chat already, and I would invite people to put their hand up as well, um, but just keep your mic on mute until we come to you. So I'll take the question from the chat first. Um, so Shaley Minosh, uh, and apologies for my pronunciation there. Um, have you noticed the relationship between positive education and academic integrity? That's a really interesting question. So I'm thinking about the best way of, of answering that. And, um, you know, maybe I'll come back to um, one of the things that I just briefly touched on in the social, um, sorry, in the self-empowerment course that um, I talked um, about as one of the examples at Harriet Watt. We engage with all of our first year students to do um, a sort of personal survey, which is called Values in Action and Character Strengths. And that talks about virtues and values that are held by um, our individual students. And um, some of those values are related to um, a sense of integrity and kind of ethical practice, a feeling that um, kind of one wants a just and fair society. And so um, those are certainly values that are positive values to engender. And for those students who feel a particular affinity with that particular uh, value and, uh, and virtue, then living a life that um, is sort of authentic with respect to those values 
is a well-known path to achieving a sense of personal well-being. Um, so in that sense, yes, there is a relationship between what we can do as educators to foster that, um, as well as promoting a sense of integrity at the same time. And, and that also helps promote or enhance those personal effectiveness skills that I also mentioned, um, because um, having good integrity um, in the workplace is certainly something that employers are, are looking for. So that is sort of building on the academic integrity that we foster at Herring Walk. So I hope that answers your question, Shailene. Thank you very much, Deborah. That, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, so next question in the chat from Abdul Muddin Muslim. Um, would you like to ask your question verbally? I can read. I can read the question if um, um, Abdul Mui doesn't want to read it out. So the first question is: um, How many hours do the students spend on this first year course that was shown in the video? So uh, the class time is two hours every week and the course runs across semester one and semester two. Um, and they also have some homework um, activities, but a, ma a major part of the course um, are two things. So in semester one, students um, spend four of those weekly sessions with um, what we call an impact coach. So it's a member of staff who works with students in small groups. So each week, the small group spends two hours working through, thinking about who am I, what is my sense of purpose, and then putting that sense of purpose into an action plan to discuss with the personal tutor. So it's, it's kind of two hours class time, but there's homework as well, um, which is shared across the group and then assessed by the personal tutor. And then in semester two, those students work in groups um, on a community project. And the idea is that the community project builds on um, uh, the SMART goals that the students set and also their own kind of personal sense of purpose, what they would like to achieve in terms of their impact on the world. So we try and kind of put like-minded students together. Some students might be interested in so education. Some students might be interested in sort of environmental issues. Um, and, you know, even during the lockdown, students have come up with some really creative projects, fundraising for charities, um, helping older people overcome um, kind of technology and social media, all kinds of different things. Um, and then, how are these values integrated into other courses? Um, that's a, a really good question. So if you look at the later elements of the Empower program, um, students focus on leading uh, teams, then leading communities, then leading enterprises. And we hope that while they're with us, most students work through leading teams and leading communities. and um, a, Again, those are, those are kind of student-led activities, but we hope that those opportunities are given to students to really kind of develop their values in a purpose-led sort of way. And they get credits for the activities that they're engaged in. And that then is translated um, not just into the enhanced transcript, that students get, but they also get an Empower certificate um, according to the different levels um, that they um, proceed through. So we recognize uh, purpose-led activities that embed um, those core values. Deborah, maybe you could expand on that as well in terms of any impact across the wider university. So I'm just trying to think of a concrete example that um, I can um, give you. So 
Um, so one, one, one example that, I could, that just kind of comes to mind is that um, in later years, we encourage our students to get involved in working in teams um, uh, to um, take part in various national competitions. So for example, um, students, if they have um, a, you know, a particular area where they would like to have impact and we hook it around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, we had a team who was um, kind of working as a, as a team on a, an enterprise to address one of the sustainable development goals. I can't think off the top of my head exactly which one it was, but they, um, they were quite not just successful in the competition, but they also, um, through this uh, project that they developed, um, they were benefiting the local community as well. Um, so that's how we try and kind of have wider impact in engaging the students in kind of deriving their own community projects. Um, and some of those, hopefully, we, we hope to kind of nurture ideas that students have that might kind of lead through to them developing startups companies around those things that they've been able to develop while they're at the university. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we have time for one last question, folks. Um, and if I don't see any hands go up or something in the chat, I do have one here, but I'll pause in case I'll anyone else would like to comment. While, while people are thinking of their last question, um, obviously, for today's talk, I've um, shared with you some of those examples on the Malaysia campus, but these are um, ideas are cascading across the campus. So um, the Learning and Teaching Academy is working on the Harriet Watt Award, which has many of the same essential principles at its heart as our um, Empower program. So that's something that will be developed and rolled out for all students. Um, and similarly, part of the year one course where students work on a personal impact statement is um, becoming um, embedded within the EBS program for all first year students in Edinburgh and also for all postgraduate research students starting, no matter which campus they're enrolled on. So some of these initiatives and programmes are being um, adopted and modified across the campuses, and that's great to see. Absolutely. So I haven't seen any hands go up or anything in the chat, so I'm going to jump in. Um, you mentioned quite a lot about growth mindset, um, and that seems to be a key underpinning for you. I wondered if you maybe just wanted to um, explain a bit more about what growth mindset actually is. So as essentially, um, a growth mindset is a way of um, approaching uh, a difficult situation or failure as an opportunity or a challenge to grow. So it's a mindset that um, kind of prevents the individual from maybe running away or avoiding a situation that may be a negative situation and just thinking, you know, whatever the outcome, whether it's positive or negative, let's just try it out and see what happens. And if it's positive, great. If it's a, a negative outcome, then, hey, I've learned something. I've learned a new life experience and I'm gonna find some way of overcoming challenges. So it, it's that not being fearful of failing and to look on every opportunity as a way of learning something new. Thank you. Now, if I can stretch our time slightly, we've got one last question in the chat. So do you have any specific strategies to motivate students to do these extracurricular activities, especially if they're really interested in their grades and see the extra as a burden? Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, obviously we can't force the students to take part in these activities. That's one thing to say. So it is optional. The strategies to motivate students, we use a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic sort of motivators. So extrinsic motivators, we offer points and credits and there are rewards for the students if they do it in terms of certificates. Um, as, as I've mentioned, and also we celebrate those successful students um, and share their good stories with the rest of the students on campus. Um, in terms of encouraging students to really get engaged with their um, core discipline, then um, some of those courses that the students do as part of their degree are also recognised with some credits in the different um, sort of domains of the Empower program. So if, for example, a, um, a course has a, a focus on team working skills or developing people skills, for example, then if the students do really well in that course, they can also kind of get enhanced points for Empower through their, uh, their uh, academic activity. So the Empower program is not just a completely separate program. It's, it's sort of embedded and built in to the academic program. So the students can do some activities within the academic program and some extracurricular activities. It's a real, real mix. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Deborah. Um, I have to draw us to a close now, I'm afraid, folks. Um, so first of all, let me sincerely thank Deborah for an absolutely fascinating um, presentation with, I'm sure you'll all agree, lots of food for thought. And I can already see comments in the chat commenting on how interesting it's been. Secondly, let me thank all of you for joining us, both colleagues from within Heriot Watt and those um, externally. We're really pleased that you were able to join us for this first fabulous session of the symposium. There's lots here that I think will resonate for us, both as individuals and as educators. You know, who wants to be the grumpy educator when we can be the effective one? So let's look after ourselves first, as Deborah has suggested, and then focus on how we support our students to flourish. Um, I hope you'll all join us for the other presentations in the symposium over the next three days. And wherever you are in the world, I hope you'll also take some time for yourself to pause and reflect on this today Today's presentation. So thank you all very much and I hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody.